God's timing. It's always perfect. And, um, you know, there's times in our lives where, as people, we, we, we look around us and we see something that needs our attention or intervention. Uh, we see injustices all around, around us, uh, wrongs that need righting, promises that need fulfilling, a dream that needs to be pursued. Now, in those times in our lives, we're faced with many decisions on what we ought to or ought not to do when we're faced with such decisions. And if we're to live a life that is in sync with God's best for us, it's of pivotal importance that we make good decisions and that in uh, making those decisions that our timing is in sync with the timing of the Spirit of God. It's not that God cannot make our mistakes um, into something good. He can turn the tables. God can take a disaster and use it for his purposes and, and make it something uh, that works out for the good. But I believe that sometimes God's people needlessly wind up suffering the consequences of bad decisions that are actually made on knee-jerk reactions rather than waiting on the Lord and waiting for God's perfect timing when something needs to be worked out. Now, by nature, I don't know about you, but by nature I'm fairly impatient. In when I look at Clint, and maybe when you look at you, you, you see probably a mixture of things, but one of the things as human beings um, that we often struggle with is impatience. We want things to happen. We want things to happen now. So the Bible is full of examples of lessons on patience and also case studies when God's people have been impatient and we can follow the story and learn lessons. And the reason why these lessons are given to us in Scripture is to help us in the future as, there, as we walk with God to avoid the pitfalls and mistakes that others before us have made. And today we're going to be focusing on such an example in the life of Abram, who was later called by God Abraham, and Sarai, who is later called Sarah, his wife. Now, if you would turn with me into Genesis chapter 15, starting with verse 1, this is the backdrop to what I would like to speak today about. So, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, starting. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Wow. Just think about this. You're uh, Abram in the middle of the desert and you're wondering what's happening with your life and where you're going and you're 74 or 75 years old. So the majority of your young years have already gone by and you're wondering, what God, what have you got? You know, I've come so far with you, but 
I got nobody that's going to be inheriting all the things that you blessed me with. And when you consider that um, there was such a powerful experience here, and this must have been something that shook him to the very foundation of his being. I mean, how can you not be shaken if God was to give you or me a vision and would speak to us in this manner, can you imagine how that would affect the rest of your life? How that would affect your going about your daily business? Now, if that wasn't enough in the vision, you see God coming towards you and engaging in conversation with you. And what did he say? He said, do not be afraid. For me, seeing God coming towards me in a vision, I'd be shaking. I'm sure we'd all be falling down before him. It would be terrifying, awe-inspiring, but the Lord knew Abram would be shaken in this way like all human beings would be if they were in that circumstance. And he says, do not be afraid. Right? <laughs> this is powerful. This is, God had to reassure Abram to tell him it's going to be okay, Abram. I, I'm going to speak to you now. Now, we see this example of how God's done this in specific cases throughout the Bible. He doesn't do it all the time, but there are specific cases where God has done this sort of thing. Other people in the Bible had this first-person encounter with a vision that God had given them. Uh, consider Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, uh, verse 1, okay? In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah cried out, Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So in the case of Isaiah's vision, an angel touched his lips with this live coal from the altar in heaven and cleansed his lips, which made him acceptable in the presence of a holy God. See, we need atonement, right? Before we're going to approach the Lord. When you, when you think about how awesome both of these visions, the one with Abram and the one with Isaiah here, would have been for these men. I, I mean, it would have had a significant impact on their entire lives. And the sovereign nature and power of the Lord was so evident. In Genesis 15, 6, we read, Abram believed the Lord and it, it, he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, I know everyone, not everyone has experiences like this, okay? But there's times in your life as a believer where God meets you in a significant way. And he leaves his imprint on a, on a circumstance in your life, and he, he does this for a reason, okay? It, it is what they call an Ebenezer. It is a milepost that you can look back to. Maybe it was on, on your conversion. Maybe it was something else. Well, along the way, sometimes it comes unexpectedly. God has a perfect timing for things, and he knows exactly what we need. He customizes his words spoken to us. Maybe, for me, one of the times I remember one of these things happened to me, it was when I was reading the Word of God. And it was just like, I was reading the Word of God, and it was just like the words almost jumped off the page and hit me square in the face. It was just like, boom! And there was just no denying it. The power of God was speaking to me. The Holy Spirit was speaking to me through the Word of God. I don't know if you had that kind of experience before, but everyone has different experiences, and we don't measure 
you know, our, you know, our spirituality by experiences, right? We don't do that. God knows exactly what we need, when we need it, how we need it. Sometimes when you're a blockhead, you need to get kicked in the pants pretty hard, right? Sometimes, you know, like I've looked at myself that way and I'm, okay, yeah, God, I'm a blockhead. Thank you. Because I, you know, other people, you know, maybe they don't need as much of a kick in the pants, but God speaks to us all nonetheless. But in the case of Abraham, in Abram's case, there was this powerful experience, but, um, well, fast forward 11 years. Fast forward 11 years. This promise was made to Abram when he was 74 or 75, and the promise had not yet been fulfilled, and he was reaching the ripe old age of 85 or 86 years old, and still no baby. Hmm. Wonder what's happening, God. No child of promise. Did God really speak to me there, or is it just something I had eaten in the desert and, and it didn't agree with me? Uh, maybe there was things happening that I, I don't totally understand, or maybe God wants me to, to do something. You know, after all, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that one? Right? Sometimes, time and trials and difficulties have a way of making us forget those Ebenezers that God has put before us as a reminder. Sometimes we need to stop and ask ourselves, Lord, do I really believe you? And if I'm waning, Lord. Renew my first love. Help me to get back to those places where that fresh, vibrant relationship was, 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 was so apparent. I don't think that's a bad prayer. Now, and we're not seeking experience. We don't go seeking experiences. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm talking about relating to God and and bowing the knee of our heart to our sovereign Lord when we don't understand why it's taking so long, why there's unfulfilled promises, what's happening. You see, time can make us forget about life's trials and difficulties that we've faced in the past, right? We know this. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, we can forget about how tough it was too, right? You know, you ever had a spell where it was really tough and then, you know, 30 years later, all you're remembering is the good things. Oh, the good old days, right? It, it leads us to long for former things and former ways, and, and people end up living in the past with rose-colored glasses, angry over the circumstances of the present. You know? I mean, I don't know what Abraham was feeling. It's not really exactly laid out for sure exactly all the feelings he was having, but I'm sure he was thinking about this. Wow, that was a great time back then, but maybe, maybe I did something. I, I don't know. Okay, We're not going to go there because we don't really know. But sometimes we forget about uh, the things that were difficult, and we have rose-colored glasses that lead us to live in the past. But sometimes we uh, forget about the difficulties um, in, in, in the past, and, and, and uh, and the good things as well. We, we forget about both, right? So it's easy for us to, to lose track of where we are. Um, it's easy in our human flesh to forget that God is sovereign. You see, we're not serving a mortal. We're serving the immortal God who is all-knowing, and he knows everything, the end from the beginning. And sometimes as believers, we get caught in the rat race of life and we forget that God is sovereign and that he understands all things, the end to the beginning to the end. This is where the scripture says, you know, I am the Alpha and Omega. God says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning and he knows the end and he knows everything in between and he is not out 
of control over the things that are taking place around us. It's so easy in the flesh, when we rely upon our flesh, to forget the nature of our God. And that we don't have to get worked up about things that seem to be out of control. King Solomon once wrote, you see, we get provoked by the things that are out of our control. Don't you get frustrated sometimes? Ah! You know, it's like working on your truck and you just can't seem to break that bolt loose, right? And finally, when it breaks loose, you bang your fingers and it's like, ah! You know, we get frustrated, we get angry sometimes at the circumstances. Oh, if only my legs would work the way that they used to. If only, you know... <laughs> I mean, we can get frustrated. One day, we're going to, brother, we're going to be out in, in, in a place where we're going to be like, uh, no pain, you know. We're going to be given new bodies. That's the hope of the believer, right? What a glorious hope we have. We don't have to worry about this stuff. So, but in the present, we get frustrated, and it's human nature to get angry about it and to get impatient, right? Patience is a virtue that not all of us have in Copious amounts. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, this is human nature, but it doesn't have to be this. We don't have to yield to our human nature. We can look at God in, in the promises that he's given in his word, and we can stand on the promises in his word, and we can stand at the personal promises that he gives us too. We can stand on that. We can take it to the bank, because if God promises you something is going to take place, he will fulfill it. If it is God speaking, he will fulfill that which he has promised. And you don't have to be anxious about anything. Yes, it's natural that you're going to be, but you need to lay that down with prayers and petitions. Lay it before him. God, I don't know what to do. Help me not to be angry and provoked about what uh, I can't change in my life. I can't change in my family. I can't change in my church. I can't change in my marriage. I can't change with my children. Ah, right? King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes this wisdom. He says, Ecclesiastes 7, 9 to 10. Do not quick, be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger settles in the lap of a fool. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is unwise to ask about this. But that's our propensity, right? I look at it and I'm, Abraham, Abram. It's like, where is this child of promise? 85, 86 years old. It's starting to feel like time is taking away the strength. Human body's starting to fail in the twilight years. We, we know this. Everyone here who's, you know, advancing in years knows the aches and pains of it all. Some more than others, but it's just the natural way. The natural inclination of our human nature laments when things don't come together. And this is something we would do well to ponder carefully because God has not given us um, a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a soundness of mind. This means that we don't have to be afraid over the things that we can't control. He's given us his Holy Spirit to empower us, to help us to love instead of be angry and hate, and to give us an understanding that he holds all things in his hand. And he works everything together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's a promise in the word of God. You can take that to the bank, by the way. Everything, not just the, the rose gardens of life, but also the pits of life, the dark places of life. He works everything together for good. Abram and Sarah were barren. Despite this glorious visitation of God, you know, some 11 years prior to this, Abram, Sarah, they were still barren, 85 years old, 86, he's getting in there. We don't know exactly when his birth date was. But they were approaching this age where women have mostly 
stop being able to bear children, right? You're 85 years old, your, your wife's 10 years younger. Or something. Most ladies you know, enter menopause before that. But where is this promise of God? All these years they have waited and waited and waited patiently. God had promised that out of his own flesh would come one who would be his heir. So let's go to Genesis 16. That's the backdrop. Genesis 16, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go and sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So Sarai encouraged Abram to take part in what essentially was a surrogate mother arrangement. Now, it's easy for us to listen to other voices speak outside of the will of God when we're discouraged, when we're feeling like it's not coming together. We feel like maybe we got to do something that God helps those who help themselves. The other voice might even be someone close to us, possibly a spouse possibly family, possibly friends who may be influenced by their own doubts when they speak to us. Now in the ancient world of that time, it was common for men to have more than one wife. It wasn't God's ideal, but it was common. According to the customs of the day, when you had a surrogate marriage, relationship, a marriage relationship where you're Part, your wife was a secondary wife. The, the primary wife, would, uh, it would be considered her children. So if you had a servant, this was commonplace in the culture of that day. You see, in our lives, sometimes there's a cultural voice that tells us, oh, it's okay to do this. It's okay to go here. It's okay to do this. Oh, this is culturally normal. It's okay. Right? Right? Those voices speak to us out there. This culture says, oh, it's okay to follow the cultural norm. The question is, is the cultural norm God's ideal? No. You see, even though it was the cultural norm for this kind of relationship, it didn't make it a profitable arrangement. God never endorsed this and he never blessed that. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by listening to the culture speaking. I'm going to tell you about a sin I committed when I was a younger man. You see, when I was a younger man, I was a, a young pastor, I, I knew what it was to be raised in a Christian home and I knew what was right and wrong by the things my parents taught me. One of the things they taught me was that it's not good to gamble. It's not wise. And for us, in our family, my parents would say, don't buy lottery tickets, don't gamble. Stay away from that, it's not wise. But of course, you're asking yourself the question, why? But, now, oh, mom and dad, okay. Well, I explored the issue. I mean, I was a young pastor, I'd, I'd explored this issue. I realized that some of the money that was raised by the lottery ticket system was coming from people with great addictions that were spending their money that should have been used to pay their rent or buy food for, and clothing for their children. They were wasting it by throwing it away at the lottery ticket system, wanting to get rich. People were hooked on the promise that money would bring them happiness. And that whole system of gambling and stuff was all sucking people into this. And maybe someone would just go, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy a ticket here or there, or I'll, I'll gamble here or there, and they had control over it, no big deal. But what about the people? What about the, the jackpot that was building on the backs of the people that were, were, were being pillaged by this eagerness to get rich, and they're sacrificing the food on the table for that? That that's was running through my head, too. That's, that was part of my upbringing. That was... I understood that, so I asked the question, well, why not? Well, that's why. That's why not. But, you see, when I was a young pastor, I, my wage wasn't all that great, and we were kind of facing a little bit of hard times. And uh, I was thinking, oh, it be sure nice to win a couple thousand bucks. Yeah, I'm at the gas station. Why don't I just go and buy that, buy a couple of scratch-and-win tickets? and Maybe I'll win something, and... 
hey, that a couple thousand bucks could really come in handy right now. So that was the temptation, right? And I yielded to that. I went and I purchased these tickets. And lo and behold, I scratched this ticket and I won two bucks. Oh, great. So I went back to the counter and, oh, that's kind of fun. You know, I, I bought two more and I scratched those and I, and I didn't win anything. So I lost my investment, right? It wasn't an investment. It was not an investment. Gambling is not an investment, people. It's not. Anyways, I'm just, something to say. That's maybe acceptable culturally. But when you look at the deeper things behind what's taking place, this is something to consider. Anyways, so I, I left that gas station. I never said anything to anybody. I just went my way. The only one that knew anything about what I did was Ginya. That was it. It was just the two of us that knew anything. But two weeks later, I'm, uh, it's the middle of the night, and I get a phone call from a young man in his early 20s. And he, had, he and his friends were having a house party at this place in town. And he phones me and he says, Pastor, he says, I need you to come over right away. And I says, what's going on? And he says, there's a guy and he's demon possessed and he's manifesting demons. And I don't know what to do about it. Ooh, that's a call that you like to receive in the middle of the night as a pastor. <laughs> so I'm like, oh Lord, help me. I walked into this place and this guy was full on manifesting demons. Like his voice was changed. He was just like, Argh. the whole nine yards. Everything you see in the scriptures was this guy doing what it, it was terrible. It was a horrible thing. <sighs> and that guy came up to me and the first thing he said when he looked at me was this. You think you're a man of God, but you're not. I know. We saw you purchase those lottery tickets. Oh, yeah. I'm calling out on the grace and mercy of God. Well, that night, God protected me, and I won't tell you the rest of the story because it's not really the point. The point is that, you see, I went ahead to try and fix a financial issue in my own wisdom. By following a culture, oh, it's not really that bad. The culture says it's not that bad. So it's not even, it isn't. Okay, yeah. You get what I'm saying here? Okay. Um, I didn't think anything of it. Sarah, Sarai, in this case, violates her conscience as well. She did something that goes against the nature of wives to give another woman to her husband to marry. She probably did it because she knew of the promise of God that Abram would be the father of many nations. I'm sure they talked about it, right? And she and Abram were getting along in years. She was probably to the point where she thought, maybe I'm not going to be able to bear children anyways. So Abram, uh, here, you know, take my handmaiden Hagar as a, another wife and have children through her, which will be our children, right? She was convinced that the promise that had been given, there must have been something wrong. There's some wires crossed. And Abram, he had the same kind of doubts too, right? Because he agreed to it. God helps those who help themselves, right? Uh -uh. Abram agreed, it says in verse 12, to what Sarai had said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Now we know this is a fact, right? Slavery, the culture of slavery, is not a good culture. Neither is the culture of having more than one wife. Both bring with them significant problems. Slavery was permitted, but I believe that it was because of a culture that had hardness of heart. All people are equal before God. And not one should be a master over another. And with regards to marriage, from the beginning God made man and woman to be a single couple. In Genesis 2.24, God ordained marriage between one man and one woman to be the correct order of the core of the family relationship. For this reason, it says, for a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The whole purpose of God was for a couple to become one flesh and to be a unit together. But you see, the culture 
And the pagan culture influenced the behavior of the people. And here they were involved in slavery and they were involved in, in polygamy. Not God's ideal. And right away, you see, there's trouble. There is trouble immediately when we deviate from God's plan. There always is. Don't ever think that you can skirt that. If you deviate from God's plan and, and you go and you, and you take a principle in God's word and you, you take it in your own direction, you take it out of context and do it yourself, right? don't think that there's not going to be some kind of consequence. There will be. It's a good thing for grace. Because all of us have done this at one point or another. We've justified things, right? We've gone along the path. Maybe it's not like this with this particular issue, but there's other issues where we, we lower the standard. So here we see Abram and Sarah opening themselves up to this surrogate, surrogate re relationship where Hagar would bear the children on the family on behalf of Sarah. As soon as they, they married and Hag Hagar conceived, she began to despise her mistress. See, I have children, you don't. So that makes me more important. Of course, she's been oppressed and a, and a servant for her whole life. So this is kind of like self-esteem boost. Woo, right? Boom. So that, that confronts it. You see, when we, oh, when we try to move the hand of God by advancing an agenda ourselves rather than waiting on the Lord to, to fulfill what he has assured us of, we we actually bring trouble. We will bring trouble. i, I got to emphasize this. We are called to trust in the Lord. And if he says it's not time for something to happen, we can't, by the flesh, usher something in. You can't, you can't force your children to accept Christ you can't force your way to see revival happen in your community. You can't force your spouse who has not believed yet to become a believer. You can't force these things. You need to bring this before the Lord in prayer and trust Him and bring it before Him earnestly, yes, and trust Him and let it go and lay it at His feet. It's not easy. You want to see that child serve the Lord. You want to see that person healed. You want to see all this stuff. You cannot force it. The sovereign God has something to say about everything that occurs. And he knows the end from the beginning. And you go, well, why, Lord? Even as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, says the Lord. This is God who knows all things. And we need to start trusting him that he does know all things and not try to force our own idea of what it should look like. So, although the, I mean, we see in verse 6, right? Um, Abram is like, okay, uh, there's conflict here. Sarah came to Abram in verse 5. You are responsible for this wrong I am suffering. That's what she says, right? The blame game starts happening in marriage, right? When things, when we make bad decisions and things start going sideways, right? The blame game starts happening. You are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And Abraham's like, oh, man. He's like, oh, hey, you do whatever your slave is in your hands, he said. Do whatever you think is best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. You see how this chain reaction of sin just keeps... This destructive wake just takes place, right? It just bulldozes everybody in its path. There's just trouble, 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 trouble. Sarah blamed Abram for the whole affair, even though she was the instigator. Abram was like, hey, you know, yeah, I married this woman, but I don't want the trouble. You do what's best, right? Take on the responsibility and then pass it off. What ended up happening? Hagar and Ishmael went into the desert. 
and she cried. Poor Hagar was, you know, herself, she had issues. They all had issues. She cried, and then the Lord came and visited her and comforted her and told her to go back to her mistress. And, you know, Hagar, you know, she was climbing out of this social position she'd been trapped under for years. And, you know, what happened here wasn't what Sarah expected. She didn't expect the emotions of having a child to make you feel, like, special. Right? Come on. Like, if you do the math here, right? She's going to feel special because she has a child and Sarah's going to be ticked off because she doesn't. Oh, man. The things, the webs that we weave in our flesh, the webs that we weave to try and work something out according to the way we see, and we ignore what's right in front of our nose. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai. You notice how God didn't, doesn't endorse slavery, but he, he addressed her by her cir circumstance, right? Where have you come from and where are you going? Right? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. So God comforted Hagar in the whole mess of this. So despite Abram and Sarah, Sarai jumping ahead of God, the Lord worked through the circumstance, had mercy on Hagar. But you look at the far-ranging consequence of this because uh, thousands of years later, this decision still resonates Today, you see, the real son of Hagar, Ishmael, is the father of the Arabs. And later, we see God does fulfill the promise with Abram and Sarah in the birth of Isaac. And they... Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, father of the Jewish people. So today, you see the consequences of this two, this two nations of people butting heads, and they butted heads all the way through the centuries. Far-reaching consequences. Did God have mercy on Hagar? Yes, he did. Did he work something amicable out there? Yeah, he did. But was there consequence to this arrangement where Abram and Sarai agreed to do this thing that wasn't right before the eyes of God? Yes, it was. Now, how much better would it have been if Abram and Sarai had been patient and waited for God to fulfill his promise to them rather than running ahead to try and work things out in their own wisdom? Now, when God makes us promises in his word, he is faithful to complete what he has promised. He will bring to fruition what he has promised in his word, and we can take that to the bank every time because God is true, and he is not a liar, and there is no lie within him. Everything he says is true, and everything that he predicts, everything that he says in the word comes to pass. So we can trust him even when it doesn't seem like things are working out. How much better is it for us to trust the Word of God and be obedient to the Word of God, even though our feelings tell us otherwise, instead of going on following our feelings and finding ourselves facing the consequences of disobedience or not trusting in the Lord to fulfill His promise? Ooh, there's a lot of lessons here, isn't there? You can take this and apply it to so many things in life. As Christians, as believers, right? We are children of God. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He says, okay, follow me. Jesus, that's what he said to his disciples. Follow me. The Lord's word to his children today is the same. Follow me. Follow me means obey me. If you love me, obey me. And if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, everything else falls into place. God takes our lives and spares us from being pierced with the grief of our disobedience when we do it. 
Commentator David Guzik says this, when we impatiently try to fulfill God's promises in our own effort, it accomplishes nothing. It may even prolong the time until the promise is fulfilled. Look at Jacob. He had to live 25 years in exile because he thought he had to arrange the fulfillment of God's promise to get his father's blessing, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, father, son, making the same kind of mistakes. Um, Look at Moses. Moses thought he had to take matters into his own hands, so he beat that Egyptian and, and killed him, right? What ended up happening? He was sent over far away from where he was into the desert for 40 years until God appeared to him in the burning bush. There was consequences. Yeah, God worked it all out and there was a timing with it all, but it doesn't mean that our disobedience is pleasing to God. When we disobey, when we jump ahead of him, yes, God can work everything together for good. As, I, as you noticed in the songs this morning, the theme is grace. Thank goodness for the grace of God because without it, we're toast. <laughs> Without the grace of God, none of us would stand. We need the grace of God and we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, not lest anyone should boast. But God's grace is given to us not to be a catalyst for us to sin more so that grace might abound. God forbid! God asks us to follow him and obey him because the fruit of disobedience is discord. It always has been and it always will be and God wants to spare us from that. So we have a choice. The scripture is given as an example for us to follow not, or not to follow in this case. Right? Sometimes the scripture gives us examples to follow. Sometimes it shows us that we need to be careful. This is a careful, be careful passage. Ah, terribly complicated and difficult situations rise out of sin every time. Yeah, sometimes you can't unmix Kool-Aid, right? You want to, but you can't unmix it. But God gives us grace if we got Kool-Aid because of our own disobedience. God can give us grace and help us to move on. Forgetting what is behind. We can come to the Lord for forgiveness. If you've made a mistake, if you've made errors in your life, you can come to the throne of God before Him and His grace covers your sin and washes the slate clean. You can forget what is behind, but you may have a consequence. You may have a consequence that's going to have some far-reaching effects, even though you have grace and forgiveness. So, um, with Abram, it wasn't 85 or 86 years old that the promise was fulfilled. God waited till it was completely impossible in the flesh for the promise to be fulfilled. There was no way that anyone could say that this is a result of my, you know, my doing. It was completely God. Because Isaac wasn't born to Abram and Sarai. Abram and Sarai until Abraham, Abraham, he was called Abraham after that, was 100 years old. Can you imagine going to Fisher Place Lodge and telling some 100-year-old couple over there (laughs) that uh, they were going to have a child? Miraculously? Yeah, in the flesh they'd be laughing, like, no, that's impossible. Yeah, yeah. It is impossible, but when God says something's going to happen, impossibility becomes possibility. And God used this to demonstrate his sovereign power and his love and his blessing despite the flesh failings of Abraham and Sarah. Oftentimes we get impatient. God's promises... We want them to be fulfilled without further ado. If we change, try to change the circumstances in our own strength, in our own wisdom, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be consequences. Learning to be patient, to trust in the Lord, 
Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and he will make your path straight. He will fulfill things that are supposed to be fulfilled. Has God given a promise to you in your heart? Maybe you've been looking at the word of God and seeing his promises, but you're saying, this isn't being fulfilled right now, God. What's going on? What are you going to do about it, Lord? You want me to do something about it? Well, you're not, you're not answering me. Maybe I should go. Do, no, don't. Don't push it. Wait upon the Lord. Cast your cares upon him. Cast your anxieties upon him. He cares for you. He sees it. He sees that relationship that you're in. He sees that child who is prodigal or who is astray or that spouse that's never given their life to him. He sees your family, the fracturing amongst the relatives. He sees your church situation. He receives, he sees all of these things. Commit them to prayer. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective and you're righteous not because of your own prowess. You're righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ that has been washed over you and you've been made clean in him because of the grace of God. You are righteous before him and the prayers of the righteous availeth much. So that means every one of us here that is blood-bought in the name of Jesus Christ and has been born again into his family is righteous before him and our prayers availeth much, my friends. Do not be discouraged in praying. As some understand this slowness in the coming of promise, don't be discouraged. Continue to seek the Lord. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, 2 Peter 3.9. As some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God's patience is immense. And it's opportunity for us to pray for those that don't know him, that are on our hearts. If we're patient and faithful, God will take care of the things the right way and in his best timing. Let's lay aside our propensity to fight and try and make things happen. Instead, be willing to wait upon the Lord. And we'll find when we do such, as such, we, our strength will be renewed. Right? We'll mount up on wings as eagles. Run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord. Let go of the reins. Let his peace reign supreme over the things that we don't have any control of, trusting that his timing is perfect, that he's sovereign. The Lord promises us this, his peace. For us believers, his peace is a promise. We need to trust the promises and the word of God. The Lord promises us in James 3.18 that peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Would you bow with me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your marvelous patience with us. We thank you for your grace that abounds, that is greater than all of our sin. We thank you, Lord, for this example of Abram and Sarai and Father, you blessed Abram and you blessed Sarai. You called them Sarah and Abraham, and they were used of you to bring about the Savior into this world through their lineage. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you never leave us or forsake us. You're always with us. For those here today that are suffering because maybe they've tried to make things work on their own and they've jumped ahead, they've tried to do things that weren't right, and they're suffering from it, God, I pray that your comfort would be with them, that they would just realize that you love them and that they are clean before you because of what you've done. And God, help them to face the decisions of the day, even if there's some consequence from past things, God, that you give them strength to overcome and to be light in the darkness of any circumstance they're in. Jesus, I just, we just pray that you'd help us to be obedient to you and not to have to learn the hard way trying to do things on our own. We look to your word and we look to you, God, to guide us. Thank you for each person that's come here today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.